to develop small and support small and medium-sized businesses across uh, Nigeria. But they've even gone further than Nigeria, supporting other enterprise development centers outside of Nigeria as well. And then we have the Institute of Humanity. So in a nutshell, that's who we have become. But then a key element of the university, which I would like to highlight, is that we have a strong Christian identity. We're not owned by a church, we're not owned by a religious organization, but then our ethos and all that we do is um, supported and in line with a strong Christian, shall I say Catholic identity. But there is a difference. So you find we have a lot of faith-based schools everywhere. We are not faith-based as I mentioned. However, we ensure that everything that we do is not inconsistent with Christian doctrine. And if I dare say, or if I may say, not there, if I may say, the things, the truths that we share are common, not only to Christianity, but to others. We have the basic tenets of faith, of humanity, things like do not kill, you know, uh, love your neighbor. These are things that are shared by all major faiths, and that is what it is. But regardless of the fact that we have a strong Christian identity, we also have a strong pluralism, which means that we're open to people of all religions, all faiths, everyone is welcome. And they're not compelled to worship, you know, in a particular uh, manner. So one of the key elements is that we have a strong Christian identity. And I think that that comes through in how we approach the education of the students that come. One of the key distinguishing factors that we, um, or attributes of our students and student life is that we educate in freedom and with freedom. All of us, I'm sure, have passed through you know, tertiary education. And we know what it is that really is a transition to adulthood. It's a place that you come and then you learn how to become an adult, which means that if you, if the uh, boundaries or constraints that hold you back, then that transition into adulthood will be stifled or delayed. Mm -hmm. We don't say that there are no guardrails, of course, there are rules, there are regulations, there are guardrails in place. However, the choice is with the individual who comes to the school. So we educate in freedom and with freedom. And our mission really is to educate professionally qualified people but that have a strong moral character. And I think that that is also one of the things that sets us apart. It's not only that we provide the expertise and the knowledge required for a professional to function um, effectively in whatever place they will find themselves, but that also they are grounded in particular values which make for a better functioning person that's cognizant, not only of their duty in their places of work, but also a greater responsibility to contribute meaningfully to society. So that's what it is that's our, our mission. And I would say that in the course of 20 years, having graduated, actually 30 years if I look back, um, but we started undergrad 20 years ago because Lagos Business School was really a uh, postgrad. But then if I look at all the graduates and we, you know, from the feedback that we get from employers as to how they proceed, I think that, you know, what we said we would do, we're doing. Because they're very much appreciated and valued, not only for the knowledge that they bring to bear in their jobs, but also for their work ethics and the values. And I think that that's something that all of us uh, would agree. It's critical to the um, development and to the functioning of not only organizations, but also of society. We don't 20 years, when we look at the future, what do we see? We spent the time building, establishing the schools, but in order to continue to make an impact on society, which we're keen on, um, we have to do other things. Um, we've established the base, we built the foundation, we believe the foundation is strong. It's now to go on and see how many more floors we add up. And um, last year we developed a strategic plan which will cover the period from 2022 to 2026. So we have five key pillars that we're focusing on for the future. We believe teaching and learning is a critical part, is one of the pillars, the critical part of what it is we want to do. Uh, because nowadays, with the generation of people that are coming into school, the way I'm talking to you now, if we had to uh, put people in the class and this is the way that they, they receive their teaching or their learning all throughout there, we will lose them. I see, I'm sure that many of us are also in the generation in which, you know what, we learn more from one another, we learn using technology, we learn using non-traditional ways of learning. So our focus 
during these five years is on teaching and learning and we'll bring in innovation and technology into the learning that we offer at Pan Atlantic University. You've come to the campus, we consider it very beautiful. In fact, I like to welcome people here, not only because of the way it looks, but also I'm very proud of what my predecessors have done in terms of building it. Uh, when we moved here in 2013-2014, uh, I wasn't at the university, then the main campus then, I was at the Lecky campus when the Gus Business School was. And after a year or two, I came to visit. And when I saw it, I crossed the people that gave us their children to come to school here. It really was an act of faith. Because really, it looked like one village, one provincial place with one building. When I see what has been achieved by my predecessor, Professor Juan Elegi, I think it's fantastic. So we're very happy with what it is. We have the academic blocks that are standing courtesy of the T.Y. Danjuma Foundation, the School of Science and Technology, um, courtesy of Nigerian Burisium, the Felix Oguiri building. And really, that's what we're about. We're about partnerships. But in terms of the infrastructure, even though we're proud of what has been achieved, we need to do more to make this the best in class for both living and learning, which means that we have to do a lot to create infrastructure that is befitting and in which we can not only learn, but can live comfortably with all the facilities in place. So that's another key pillar of um, our strategic plan. Another one is community engagement. As you know, we're located in a village. Um, I know that there's the express road now. It doesn't look that way. But just beyond the expressway, on both sides, we have the village. Um, so when we talk about community engagement, it's not only what we do with the neighboring communities, which are the villagers. And we do a lot. I'm especially proud of what the students do with their community service projects, going to the um, communities on Saturdays to give classes to children in primary school using the town halls or whatever facilities that we have a good relationship with the local government. But it's also what we aim to do within this five year period um, with the organizations that have their offices in this area. As you know, this is more or less the new industrial area of Lagos. So we have the free trade zone that's not so far from here. And we have a lot of you know large organizations that are located in this area now. We hope that we can foster a partnership between the local community, between the businesses, and also ourselves, that research into what it is that can be helpful to the organizations, but also benefits the community. So we have um, community engagement as one of them. And then there's research and scholarship. We can't be a university without you know, research. And we're young, as I said, you know, um, 20 years old, um, we don't have the numbers of faculty that the old established schools are. What will distinguish us will be the quality of the research that we do and how well we publish and publish in journals that can do two things. One, we need to publish in the top journals, global journals, for the reputation of the school. We believe that we have very well qualified researchers and scholars, but to publish in those journals, it takes a lot, so that's what we need to do. But we're not unmindful of the fact that our research has to be impactful. So indeed, it has to be striped both. One is publication in four star journals, which is the top you know, global journals. But the second is applied research that you know, can actually do something and cause a change in this um, environment. So again, these are what it is that we hope to do going forward um, for um, the future. And then the last pillar is people. We can't do people and culture. We can't do all the things that we aspire without people. And I think that one of the things that has stood the university in good stead and has helped is a key success factor is the quality of people that we have here. We're universities, so we don't pay as much as the banks, the telecoms, organizations, and things. But I believe that we have very committed individuals that understand what we're trying to do and the impact that we hope to make. And together, we've been able to grow the university to this height. But then in order for us to, uh, as we say, take it to the next level, then we need to also invest in the people. And for us, we believe not only in the students, we believe that for the individuals that work within the school, we're also interested in their professional and personal development. Development as human beings and development professionally, and that's what we offer. And we hope to continue to offer so that together we can attain greater success. So I think that in a nutshell, that's who we are, where we're coming from, and where we're going. 
Um, for the rest of the session, I do believe that you will have a chance to interact with you know um, those of us on this side of the room. Um, I'm not so sure we can call this a high table <laughs> same level as everybody knows. So just those of us on this side. But once again, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come and be with us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Enase Okunedo, our Vice Chancellor, for uh, introducing us and formally announcing that PAU is turning 20 this year. I think a uh, round of applause will be befitting at this time. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. LBS, you know, is 10 years older, but it's one of our schools. And every time I get the opportunity to mention that I attend this institution, you know, it's setting level of shoulder pad increases. You know? <laughs> because of this uh, respect and, you know, distinguishing look, ah, PAU, and they say it's LBS. And I have to give a little brief uh, education and separate, you know, LBS, yes, but there's also PAU. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, at this point, I'd like to give a few housekeeping rules. Uh, just to ensure the smooth uh, transition and seamless operation of this media party. Uh, so for those of us in-house, we'd like to request that our phones be put on silence or vibrate. Uh, we'd like to request very minimal movements as well, please. And for our uh, those joining us virtually, we'd like to kindly request that you mute your microphones when you join and um, just uh, enjoy the, the, the party that will be happening. Uh, before we go on, we'd like to recognize a very special uh, person who was a member of the PAU community and a founding member of PAU itself. He was here for majority, if not all of the 20 years that PAU has been in existence for uh, Dr. Michael Kolo, who we uh, sadly just lost. So we just want to recognize him. He also was one of the brains behind this party. Um, the pity he's not here to see come to life, but we're sure that he's proud and he's smiling wherever he is right now. So we recognize and we honor you, late Dr. Michael Kolo. Uh, who was the Dean of the School of Media and Communications. Uh, now, we'd like to hear from the amazing powerhouses seated here with us in our, not high table, but the very <laughs> distinguished position. I'd like to begin by introducing uh, the Dean of um, the Lagos Business School, who is joining us virtually. His name is Professor Chris Obechi. Uh, we'd like to recognize him. Um, as he joins us. So we'll, I think we'll go around and recognize and welcome all our panelists before we begin to ask questions. Mr. Ivy, it's over to you. All right, um, here today we have the acting dean uh, of the School of Media and Communication, uh, the woman, the great woman in yellow, is <laughs> <laughs> um, We also have the director of the Enterprise Development Center, Dr. Peter Bankoli. Thank you so much for joining us here. <laughs> Also to my left, the uh, elegant doctor and the dean of uh, social media, social manager, uh, SMSs, the dean of SMSs, uh, Dr. Uluwa Shola Uni. Of course, certainly, uh, last but not the least, the last born of the family, <laughs> the dean of the School of Science and Technology, Dr. Darlington Aholo. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you very much. All right, so I think we can begin with Dr. Uh, Professor Chris Obeche, I beg your pardon, the Dean of LBS. If he's ready and available to speak with us, we'll be asking um, just a very simple question across board uh, this morning before our journalists in-house and online will be given the opportunity to ask their own questions as well. Um, is Professor Chris ready for us, please? Okay. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Good morning to you. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Let me start by apologizing for not being there in person. Unfortunately, we have a group of people from Pegasus. You know, we have fuel shortage issue. And if we don't attend to them, that fuel shortage issue might even deteriorate further. Mm -hmm. So we are stuck with them here. And that's the reason why I ask them to please allow me to join you virtually. Well, you can see me, I can also see you. You can hear me, but I'm not sure if I can hear you. So if you want to talk, you have to probably shout. No problem. My pleasure to welcome you to, all of you to this uh, 
media party. As the VC has already stated, we have an unusual situation here where the child gave birth to the mother. And it's only in Nigeria that such miracles can happen. <laughs> <laughs> so Lagos Business School started 10 years before PAU. And of course, we were established on the foundation of the inspiration of the teachings of St. Jose Maria Eshawa, the founder of Opus Dei. And for us at Lagos Business School, we strive to be a world-class business school which will have significant impact on the practice of management, not just in Nigeria, Africa, but globally. And we also, I wouldn't say we're in the business, but we say that our own purpose is to develop responsible leaders and managers. So responsible leaders, not just any leader. And because of that tag, we place a lot of emphasis on two areas. Actually, I tell people that we have two vaccines. That if you come to Lagos Business School, you must be inoculated with those two vaccines. Business ethics, sustainability. For business ethics, you have first dose, second dose, booster, and even the fourth dose. For sustainability, we give you one first dose, second dose, and booster. So, no matter the program, whether degree or executive seminars, we have to. The reason being that if we don't do that, we cannot then achieve that purpose of developing responsible leaders. And for us in the school, for those of you who have not visited, please you are invited to visit the school anytime. And I can assure you will enjoy our lunch, in the best and I wouldn't call it cheapest, but cost effective restaurant anywhere in Lagos. So I call values in integrity, professionalism, spirit of service, mutual respect and community. And we live out these values. We don't just live out the values, people who go through us, our MBA students, our executive program participants, are also expected to imbibe these values. And we are today enjoying the work that my predecessors did. First, the pioneer dean of the school, Professor Alos, Professor Emeritus, he laid the foundation. And some will say he planted the seed. Professor Legido, the very first professor of business ethics in Africa, watered, Professor Nase added more water, and now they asked me to reap the fruits that they planted and nurtured. Over the years, right from inception, we always believe that we have to listen to people who have made it in the business world, in government, and will invite them to join our advisory board. So if you can imagine the very first advisory board of the school was made up of, if I mention the name, you say, who is who in Nigeria? Late the Kramer, who was honored two days ago here in Lagos. Late Chief Ernest Shonekon, Chief Olu Akungbe, General Chofizal Danjuma, Fasal El Khalil of 7up, uh, Dennis Odife, Felix Ohiwere, Christopher Kolade, Pascal Dozier, and Akintola Williams. So if you look at this kind of, the, the, the caliber, the cream of Nigeria society formed the very first advisory board. And they helped in laying the foundation for what we are today. And over the years, we have produced people that have gone to shape the business world, even to some extent, government. And we are proud to say that some of the governors have served, like Peter B, happen to be alumni of, of the school. We also have the current governor of Lagos State is an alumnus of the school. 
And we have about 8,000 of them in different parts of the world. Mention any CEO in top private sector firm or anybody who is on the board of these companies, the chances are that they have passed through Lagos Business School. But I keep telling them that they are making so much money and they have forgotten us. So I think the next track is how are we going to squeeze them to give us just a very small, the things that fall off from their, their, the crumbs that fall off from their tables so that we can continue to maintain the standard that the school is known at the inception, as a business school, we did not set our sights on being the best in Nigeria. We set our sights on being one of the leading business schools globally. And that's the reason why we went for global accreditation. So we have two accreditations that are well known in the world, ASESB, a AMBA, and these are the top leading accreditation bodies globally. And we were the, the only school in West, only business school in West Africa to have these two accreditation. But we did not stop there. So one thing is to be known globally in terms of accreditation, but we also have to ensure that the quality of service we deliver is high. That the customer experience or participant experience is pleasant. Before they come to us, when they are with us, and even when they leave us. And that's why we went for ISO certification. And last year, we were the first tertiary institution to have the ISO 9001 certification, which is a mark of, of the standard of service that we render. So uh, uh, we have degree programs. MBA and the MBS in four cohorts, full-time MBA, modular MBA, executive MBA, and modular executive MBA. Let me tell you, they all does the MBA degree. But the four cohorts is aimed at meeting specific target markets, their needs. The full-time MBA is for students or for managers who have three years experience, they have to leave their jobs and come in, spend 21 months with us, 18 months actually, plus three months in uh, internship. And it's usually seen as a good investment because when they leave, when they leave us, they get better jobs, higher pay. And within six months of leaving us, at least 90% of them get employed. We also find an interesting trend that about 20% of them end up starting their own businesses. The modular MBA is for those who don't want to leave their job and still go through the MBA program. And that's for two years. They must have at least three years work experience. And then we have the executive MBA, which is for those, the senior boys who have at least seven years work experience and they spend weekends with us, Friday afternoon and Saturday, so they can still do their jobs, but at the same time, improve their own executive capacity and capability. Then we have the modular executive MBA. This again are those, they don't come weekends because many of them live, stay outside Lagos, but they come in one week every two months, stay with us, so six weeks in a year. That means they can take part of their leave or their leave to pursue this, the MBA program. 60% is in-person and 40% online. But at the end of the day, the same quality. And our MBA is rated number one in Africa. The executive programs, again, are designed to help businesses develop the executive capacity to run their businesses efficiently, effectively, and sustainably, and also grow. And all the students who've gone through executive programs, 
and they've come in different categories. The highest being the global CEO Africa. For companies who are looking at having their own African footprint, already have African footprint, they have best to run their businesses across the continents. Then the CEP, Chief Executive Program for Nigerian-based companies, Advanced Management Program for those who are in the C-suite, Senior Management Program for those who are in middle management, and we'll have Management Accelerator Program for the young and upcoming leaders. But we have an interesting program that is peculiar to us because Nigeria, if you look at Nigeria, that they see Nigeria as an entrepreneurial country. So we have the owner manager program, which is designed for those who start their business, own it, but need to know how best to grow the business, have the necessary structure to grow the business, and hopefully get it beyond the first generation. And within that, we also drive what we call the family business. Because most businesses in Nigeria, most small businesses actually start as family business. And in order to, say, uh, to help us be self-sufficient in food, which is still a long order, we started a program called Agribusiness Management Program to help those who are in the agribusiness to know how to run this as business. Many people, when they retire as CEO of banks or big companies, think that agri is a hobby. It's big business. But the other thing is I wanted to encourage the young people to come into this, into this sector because most people see farming as something for the old generation, but that we can make agri exciting for young people. So these are the executive programs. And all those who go through the executive programs become members of our alumni association. And right now we have about 8,000 of them. In addition, we also have customized programs to enable us to discuss with companies, understand their problems, their pain points, what their goals are, their uh, strategic goals, and how we can help them get there. So the tailor-made programs to help them actualize their dreams. Then we have open enrollment program, short focus programs in specific functional areas. Again, to help with developing the necessary skills. But also realize that in addition to this, there are certain areas that we need to invest our efforts in terms of research. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Chris. Uh, yeah. Uh, because of time, uh, we've, we've really been enlightened about uh, the Lagos Business School and everything. You know, I know you haven't really said everything, but I'm sure with all we have heard about Lagos Business School, it's really interesting to be a family uh, with Lagos Business School. Uh, at this point, we would like to um, give room for the director of the enterprise. Development Center. So, just give us a brief, a very brief history of um, EDC and EDC's contribution towards sustaining, uh, building, and sustaining the culture of excellence. Thank you. So, I think they are, they have some questions here to ask the members of the panel before they leave. You can take some questions from the journalists. Before you speak, Doctor Bankoli, please. I uh, would like to request that the journalists in house who have questions. Could uh, bring their questions forward or you know, project from where you are if possible. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Please yeah. can we introduce yourself and the organization that you're with before you go on? I represent African Plus Community. Okay, let me start by congratulating the management on this milestone. Then I would like to know the level of enrollment or in terms of impact that the university has made so far on the Nigerian society. I'd like to listen to each more of that and tell us probably the number of students that we have, whether we have uh, international students around, and other challenges that are limiting the university to actually run far than what is expected because you told us about trajectory in the last 20 years, 
10 years of NPS and all that, we were able to do development of the five years strategic plan. So what are those other reforms and all that? Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, in terms of um, enrollment, currently at the undergrad level, we have about 1,350 uh, students that are, um, well, undergrad on this main campus, undergrad as well as master's programs, uh, 1,350. That's the, uh, about the number of students that we have, excluding uh, Lagos uh, Business uh, School, which as um, the dean has just mentioned, um, focuses only on the only degree program we have is the MBA program. Now, um, in terms of our expectations, we expect that we will grow at a rate of 15% going forward. Um, how we have always behaved is that we take it easy. We like to consolidate on what we've done, and then we take incremental steps gradually when we are sure that we have a solid foundation and growth will not be done in such a manner as to distort what it is we've already um, established. When we talk about the challenges, I think that the dean may wants to chime in here. One of the critical things that I see just from my uh, perspective is that um, the area in which we're located, access to this area is um, a bit challenging. Um, the, I must commend the local state governments and the uh, private individuals that have so far been instrumental to trying to ensure that the roads are built. You can see, I'm sure on your way here, you notice the road construction that's going on. But then for students who live off campus, for staff who have to come here every day, um, accessibility is critical, especially during the rainy season. So that's one of the critical challenges. Of course, like everyone else in Nigeria, we deal with that part of the infrastructure, we deal with the other infrastructure limitations. All of us know how um, the cost of diesel has gone up so far. We're fortunate that we power our generators by gas. But even then, with gas pipelines, there's also sometimes constraints. So I would say one of the major constraints is infrastructure. The second constraint that I would like to speak about is um, about finding we would like to grow, uh, but we will not sacrifice growth by lowering uh, expectations as to the standards of the people that we take in, in here. Right now, our cut off mark is one of the highest at 220 um, out of 400. We would like to continue pushing that forward. But in order to push that forward, so that is only the best of the best that will come here. Um, but in order to push that forward, we need a pool of uh, highly qualified applicants that can take it. And uh, we've seen what the results look like for the UTME. And overall, if there was you know, uh, more people that had those sort of numbers, it will create a wider applicant pool for us. In terms of international students, currently at the undergrad level, we do not have any international students. Uh, we contend with a lot of things this morning. Uh, the director of BBC, Dr. Peter Bankole, and I were just discussing, he was making a great case for how, despite the constraints, we should be able to attract international students. So uh, right now we don't have at the undergrad level, but I'm aware that at Lagos Business School, they do have some study and exchange programs for other nationalities to come. Thank you very much. I don't know whether the deans will want to chime in with any additional constraints that they face now. No, not yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. Yes, sir, please. Good morning, everybody. Okay. My name is Michael Poche from TBC. I'd like to congratulate uh, the Pan Atlantic University. 20 years is no joke, and uh, wish you well as you get along. Now, my question is very short and uh, straight to the point. The, we've seen the process, at least we've, we've been interacting with the school, and we see how you've been molding and shaping young people to make them relevant to the market. Uh, is there a mechanism to ensure there's a mentoring even when these molded persons leave the school so that when they're out there they keep to the ethics because we see around you can feel and touch the ethics that we talk about so is there a mentoring program where you ensure that they keep to those standards even when they when they leave here so they are not choked by always the all the nuances in the society okay. I'll pass this to both the Dean of SMSS as well as the Acting Dean of SMC to answer because they've graduated 
uh, the youngest kid on the block is here to graduate, <laughs> but then the other two have, so we need to really speak about it. Beginning with Dr. Shanaudi. Thank you very much for that question. So yes, um, we're, we're very aware of um, what you've talked about. We do have a very strong mentoring um, system in place while they're here. And we don't just cut off the relationship because they have graduated. Um, I had a unique experience uh, last week. One of our ex-students was visiting and was telling me about how her passion mind has progressed. And suddenly she started to talk about sustainability and how she needed to reduce her waste and also move on from fast fashion to ensure that um, she's not making a, a huge what's it called, a mark on, um, on the environment by wasting resources as well. And that um, encouraged me because it was obvious that uh, she was still mindful, not just of profit, but also of the importance of sustainability. So we don't cut off the relationship. We have a very um, vibrant upcoming alumni association as well that also um, ensures that they keep um, up all of these standards even while they're out there. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Thank you so much for that question. I would also like to add to what um, Dr. Lee said. Actually, she said it's up. We have a very strong ethics in the way we do things here. So the ethics we invite on students is not just for, passing exams and leaving school. It's so ingrained in them that this culture of excellence we're talking about, they remember it even when they leave school. So it means that whatever we do, we are doing it, we are doing it in freedom. They are freely learning how to do those things. That means that when you live here, you effortlessly still do those, those things. We're not only giving them ethics that they will just practice in school while everybody's looking at them. When they go out of school, they, they build a now. No. We ingrain in them the quality, the intellectual quality, the, the ethics, the professional um, understandings that they need to go outside. But that does not end there, like she said. We have also a vibrant alumni that continuously give them platforms to showcase what they do. And then we're all a, a family that learn from each other and also contribute to the progress of this school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to briefly ask, ask uh, Dr. Peter Bankoli to comment because even though they don't graduate, you know, degree uh, programs, um, they do have graduates from their various certificate programs, and they have a robust system in place to ensure that the learning continues. So please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Conedo. Now, our own case is very interesting and very unique because we mold them when they are already formed. So it's very interesting. Um, the, perhaps the most controversial class we have in all our programs will be the ethics class. When they come out after the first session, there, there's a lot of reasons to believe that what we're teaching them will never work naturally. And so there's a lot of noise and so many things. But because we teach ethics across all the various sessions, when they, by the time they graduate, then they start thinking that they could be what we said they should be, which is the entrepreneurial leaders that are formed on the basis of ethics. And several years down the road, we always follow them. It's not just about being a member of the alumni for us. Every member of our ecosystem must be visited one way or the other. And we have touch points, at least four touch points in a year, all of them. So whether you are coming for conference, whether we're going to visit you, and so on and so forth. But more importantly, we are seeing that a number of them are taking responsibility to change our society. I'll give you one very good example. Uh, we have a lady, uh, Femi uh, Olaibi, that runs and I think she makes one of the best handbags in Africa today. Don't quote me, it's real good actually. <laughs> and then, but she had so many issues or she encountered so many problems, some burden on ethics on so many things. And then because of what she had gone through with us, she said, I am going to lead this mission and change the narrative. And then she took all the other people who are in the same business 
quite a number of them also passed through us. And then they started changing that narrative. Five years later, we have what we call um, the Lagos Leather Fair, consisting of those doing handbags, doing that. And they are now brought in all the stakeholders, from government to the financiers to all of that. And they are beginning to see that even at their own space, they can change, they can make things happen. And then two weeks ago, they had the Lagos Leather Fair uh, 50 year. And she looked at me and said, Banky, you know, this thing is actually possible. So before, it's like, is it possible? Is it not possible? Yes, you are going to meet resistance. Yes, it's not a, 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 it's going to be a rough road. But ultimately, when we stay on the course, it is very possible. And that's just one example. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, let me also join my, my colleague there too. Okay. Yeah, me Adiko, is my name. Um, I work with the Guardian newspapers. Let me join my colleagues there to congratulate um, um, Pan Atlantic University as well. My question is um, very simple. I want to find out the how possible can we get the number of graduates that um, Pan Atlantic University you know has graduated in the last twenty years. So it's very possible. We do have, as the dean of um, Lagos Business School said, well, when we count the graduates of Lagos Business School, we count the graduates. Thank you. When we count the graduates of Lagos Business School, we count the graduates not only from the degree programs but also from the executive education programs. And uh, when he made his opening speech, he spoke about the fact that currently they have eight thousand alumni. So they have eight thousand that graduated from Lagos Business Schools um, from this main campus from the School of Media and Communication and from SMSS will have to add it up. But a little prayer that they can give that to you right afterwards. I do have for the last three years, but for the four years before that, no, I haven't added it up. So Timitopo will provide that to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is Peter. <laughs> has just reminded me that the day count as graduates. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I made it not just as a joke, but it, it flows into impact. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that, um, yes, we do not do the degree programs, but in terms of graduating people that are making a difference in our society today, uh, that number is mind blowing. Let me start by saying we had like three programs with the government, which we had done graduation. You must have heard of UA. EDC was right in the middle of that for three years, in fact, four years. Today, we are running a program for the MasterCard Foundation, working with youths across Nigeria. And every year, we are graduating 40,000 of them. Every year. This is an online program, so we've shifted the business model. These guys run, we, we do the program uh, 12 to 15 modules over a period of four months. So yes, it's not your typical degree program, but it's helping us to change the narratives for the young people today. They're accessing capital, they're developing and their, their businesses, they're impacting the society. And so it's not degree, but yes, we are graduating. And, and that figure, and they're employing people, they're creating wealth, they're creating uh, jobs. And today, I can tell you, if you want to take our numbers and add to it, that will be about 200,000. You want to take out. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Okay, okay my name is Peter Oluka, and I present the tech economy that I did. And once again, I want to say congratulations to Panatak University for the impact it's made in society so far. So my own is coming from the from the angle of intervention. Do you have some projects ongoing that probably you want us to emphasize on? Probably that will help so that those outside the world of um, the campus can hear about them and probably interventions can come. Well, some of those projects. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, Dr. Daliti Nagolo, um, Dean of the School of Science and Technology, will answer. Thank you very much. This is very logical indeed because uh, being a baby, we are still um, growing. And so, we really, we started in 2020, November 2020, and we took in our first set of students. And so, the, the engineering students are now in their second year, computer science also in second year. But we have three programs: computer science, electrical electronics engineering, 
and then mechanical engineering. Now, in terms of what we are needing, <coughs> you know, to train the engineers, to educate the engineers, one of the key challenges you find in the country is the lack of infrastructure, precisely equipment, laboratories, tools. And so you find an engineer, a young engineering graduate who just finishes and then he doesn't, hasn't seen anything, any machine, any late machine, hasn't touched anything. And so he lacks confidence. And we quickly want to address that from the very beginning. In fact, we've already invested about 150 million to just for infrastructure alone in terms of equipment. But we need more. We need more participants of the equipment for our workshops, for our laboratories. And I'll give you an example where they are in the second year now. By, the, by next year, they'll be their third year, and we start with specializations. Okay, and with things like uh, numerical control machines in, in workshops, uh, things like the PLC machines. And there are many of these equipment that require um, serious funding so that they can have hands on exposure. For us, the, what we are bringing to the table as School of Science and Tech is a different narrative. Engineers must be able to solve practical problems, apart from the theory knowledge that they have. And this gives them a lot of confidence, you know, both in the industry, in government, and elsewhere. So if you ask yourself, why is it that the, the train line between Okomaiko and CMS is currently handled by Chinese and, and so on. It's because of the lack of confidence and skills of our engineers. I must confess on that. And so we want to build that from the very beginning. Our students, our graduates, the practical engineers. And we're doing that every course they do, they put the practical components of it. So in terms of what we need, we need a lot of funding for equipment in the area of medical workshops and laboratories. Really of electrical engineering, even in computer science, to help people. We have already a full lab of one of the labs for uh, computer, um, with computers, but we need a second one because we're going to start a master's program in data science come October. <coughs> engineering science cannot be just on theory, it always requires facilities. And if you can um, direct us <laughs> to companies or to people who can you know partner with us uh, in this area of uh, infrastructure provision and the very device. I don't know if I missed anything. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, I, I'd just like to add um, two things. So the model that the university has always adopted is really partnering with industry for brick and mortar. And you know when I was speaking I spoke about the fact that uh, academic complex uh, was funded by T.Y. Danduma Foundation, the School of Science and Technology by Nigerian Bruce, named after Mr. Felix Uhibere, Lagos Business School, built 80% um, contributions from the industry. But beyond the contributions to um, building infrastructure and the brick and mortar, I think when we talk about the projects that we're involved in, one of the things that I would like to see come to fruition is what I'm terming the sustainable PAU, Sustainable Pan-Atlantic University. You know, the issues of sustainability are not at all um, given prominence, especially in our parts of the world, but it is real. How do we use the resources we have today in such a way that we don't jeopardize the ability to use them in the future? It's a critical question. But most times, because in our part of the world, maybe because of the challenges that assail all developing countries, our focus is on survival, is on cash flow, which is important. All of those are important. But then, how do we use those things so that we don't compromise the long-term future on account of our short-term gains? And therefore, Sustainable PAU is a project that is still being conceptualized. But when we hope to partner with industries on research, about ways to include more sustainable practices in their management of things. Be it in the use of resources, in the way they recycle things, in the use of how they power their places. I'm especially proud that we're powering with uh, gas, which reduces it. EDC has a green building uh, that they have. You know. So again, we should be thinking about those things. And for such a project, we welcome partners that can come together, sit with us, um, discuss, brainstorm, you know, we talk about more or less 
the Helix model, which is, you know, what we begin academia, we're bringing industry, we're partnering with university, you know, just sort of sitting down and saying, what can we do to move the needle forward in terms of sustainable business practices of Nigerian organizations? So that's also a project in which we work on partnership in other ways. Um, always open to partnerships that provide funding. We live in a community, as we mentioned, uh, community relations is part of our engagement in terms of the people in the village who would like for them to come here. We do offer scholarships. So 10%, we offer 10% scholarship to people from the community. 10% of the total class size we offer to the community. But then most times um, to find the qualified people, which is why we have the students, um, CSR project, community service project, in which they go and then they teach things. But then just think about what it is. If more rich Nigerians would offer scholarships to people in this community, not only to come here, but also to go to a number of universities here. But let's raise the level of education and put education at the forefront of the agenda of us as a nation. And one way to do that is to ensure that we have qualified people who we can give the opportunity to attend universities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. I mean, I can testify to Dr. Valentin speaking about right. the practicality of the course because every other day I see someone wearing a lab coat or whatever, <laughs> you know, working on some interesting factor. So I'd like to thank uh, the journalists for joining us and for the questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and your presence. God bless you. Um, so I think over to you, please, uh, with the, while we continue to ask our panelists some questions about the different units that they had. Okay, thank you. Um, so let, let me um, start by saying, I don't know whether it is uh, coincidental, but the two people sitting uh, or guarding the VC are going to be engineers. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I, I happen to be the first real child after the university <laughs> was created. Uh, we are now 19 and a half years old. And the uh, Darlington is the last one. So the first is on the right and the youngest is on the left. What a coincidence. Anyway, so a few things that um, we need to share. First of all, from our own mission, which aligns very well with that of the university and also with what uh, Professor Igbeche has already mentioned, is about developing entrepreneurial leaders. And so it's not just leaders, but those that lead entrepreneurially. And this is important because beyond the work that they do, within their own ecosystem, they must also be able to. So I have used Femi B as an example. Uh, even for us as EDC, as an example, we lead within our own community by helping to develop other EDCs around the university system. Um, we look at um, Another lady that is into cocktail. Today, she's developing everything and all the community. And that's why you have Lagos Cocktail Week. Uh, and she's the one that is leading that. So we teach them not just to be excellent in what they do, but to take charge and take responsibility within their own uh, sector. Now, um, when we started about um, 19 and a half years ago, our initial focus was on uh, developing the small and medium scale businesses. We noticed that across the world, Nigeria, yes, we were very entrepreneurial, no doubt about that. And uh, Professor Bechel mentioned that. But the challenge is that we were operating in the fringes. And so we were not adding real value uh, to the economy. And people were just doing things at the micro level. So we needed to change that and to make people move into the mainstream. And for us to be able to do that, we have to first of all do a study as to what is constraining them and then fix those constraints. Today, I can tell you that Nigerian entrepreneurs, we are beginning to see them uh, in mainstream Africa, almost in every aspect. Um, of course, entertainment is a major one, uh, just coming back from Ghana and Nigerian music is honestly a killer there. Mm -hmm. And the, it, it's not about, uh, it, it helps to also dimension even your culture and many things that you're able to do. Then of course, uh, Nollywood, I'm sure she can talk more about that. That has gone into mainstream, not just Africa, but globally. 
today on Netflix, you are not just seeing um, Nollywood movies anymore, but you are even seeing global movies that are now infusing uh, Nigerian culture and language into them. This is very interesting. Now, and so those, those were the tenets, those are the real reasons why we started. But about eight years ago, seven years ago, we then shifted from looking at just these small businesses outside the university system into the university system. So we institutionalized um, our award system for best entrepreneurs at the end of every four years. Uh, we teach entrepreneurship for one year across all disciplines. Uh, we make sure that they start business in school on campus. And of course, I'm sure all the lecturers can testify. Sometimes they could be, you know, a pain because mm -hmm. you, you know, they hustle. We teach them how to look for opportunities, how to create values, and how to, to make sure that they get reward for that. Now, but the interesting thing for me is that it is about developing their mindsets. Not necessarily that they must end up with uh, businesses at the end of the day, at the end of the four years, even though they do. But when they create that mindset, even when they are employed somewhere, they become entrepreneurs within those organizations. Uh, but I can tell you that the education that has been given, not just in EDC, but across the university, uh, tends to make people to become entrepreneurs ultimately. And I use my class as an example. I did um, MBA prior to the uh, establishment of PA at LBS. And um, maybe not more than 10% of those in my class were entrepreneurs. Today, at least 90% of those in my class now, they are all entrepreneurs. Wow. So that, that is the way in which that mindset formation happens. And how over the year you have been able to do that. Um, there's a whole lot more I can say, but I think mm -hmm. I will give uh, you know, space to somebody. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Dr. Bankoli, for, for that uh, very brief um, talk about the impact that um, EDC has had on the culture of excellence so far. Um, a couple of our viewers online <laughs> uh, would like us to reintroduce our panelists. So um, I'll allow Mr. Edith to handle that for us. Please. All right. Okay, um, we have the Dean of Social and Management Sciences, School of Social. Uh, School of Management yeah, and Social, social Sciences. Sciences. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why I keep messing up. don't just <laughs> All right. School of Management and Social Sciences, Dr. Oluwashola Oni. And then we have the director of the EDC Enterprise Development Center, Dr. Peter Bam Kole. And of course, our very own Vice Chancellor, Professor Mrs. Okunet Enase Okunedo. And uh, uh, the Dean of Science and School of Science and Technology, Professor Dr. Darlington Avalo, and the Acting Dean of uh, School of Media and Communication, Dr. Mrs. Ngozi Okbar, and I am a his once again and my co host. Uniyichi Ekumakama. Another tongue to start off and attempt to pronounce it. <laughs> All right, so um, let me move on to the acting dean of the School of Media and Communications, Dr. Ngozi Okbar. would like to know um, briefly the impact that the School of Media and Communication has had on the culture of excellence that PU is building and attempting to sustain. Thank you so much for that question. Um, School of Media and Communication, as we all know, started as Center for Media and Communication in 2006. So, and that's for the professional education to equip professionals in the private and public sector. Professionals who need reskilling in trying to do their job very well. That was how we started. But knowing the importance of media in the development of any nation and in line with the values of Pan-Atlantic University, we thought that it's good to expand the scope of what we do in the center of media and communication by introducing 
academic programs and other programs. And so that's how we also started undergraduate and postgraduate programs. Of course, postgraduate students that I started, started before the undergraduate programs that started in 2014. So in order to have, have different units in School of Media and Communication that are really trying to align with the mission of the university, that is to form competent professionals who we encourage to see how they can use the values they learn from this university and make impacts, greater impacts in their different communities or in the different areas they, they work on. So, and that's how we started. So the academic programs, we have three different departments for now. We have mass media and writing departments, where we have mass communication studies and all these things. We have information and uh, information and media studies. We have also Center for Media Enterprise Department. And we're also working on a new two new departments. One undergraduate department, which is film production and multimedia, and then another master, uh, uh, we're still working on that in data science or uh, no, anima animation. Okay, so this is about um, academic programs. And we have done a lot. We have quality faculty that won awards. Not quite long ago, last year, in, uh, last month in particular, Chike Mwadiche uh, won the award, the best, uh, the, the, the lecturer of the year award by Future Leaders Academy. And one of our students also, a second year student of ISMS, also won the best students of the Future Leaders Academy also across Nigeria. So in 20 years, you can do that in 20 years. We, we came first by our people who have been there for many years. You can imagine where we're where we heading to. So we have different quality professors who have uh, uh, academics rather, who have really published in very good quality journals. So when we started, we were being encouraged to do so many things. And now with the incentives being provided by the school, we are aspiring to do more. And we've been publishing. There are some people, some people, someone won Best Paper Award in 2019 and so on and so forth. So that's about academic program and we're doing a lot to see that when students come here, they experience this culture of excellence we are talking about, and we've been trying to do that. And we have so many testimonies from different companies who will send our students on internship. And internship is one of the ways we try to bridge the gap between town and town. And we've been doing a lot in that regard. And we also have the professional education units. This unit is where we have a lot of interventions. Right now we have about three major collaborators we have, we have um, Nigerian Communication System, we've co collaborated with them, Nigerian Communication Commission, uh, Nigerian Communication Commission. we have Bibila and Melinda Gates Foundation, we also have Nigerian Flyer Mills, and recently we have MTN, we are collaborating with MTN to see how we can have media innovation because the world has changed because of the way media is changing. So apart from that, we have the Nollywood Center, that is why we are doing a lot. Nollywood Center is trying doing a lot. It's a research center and it's a kind of place where you see any film in the Nigeria. I, I, I repeat, any film, we are cataloging all those things. We are doing a lot of analysis. We are inviting the stakeholders and then come and collaborate where we will do our own impact to see how we can help them. And you see, we are really doing a lot in that direction also. Recently, we have also noticed gaps in the way. The, 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 what the VC tried to say about impact research. And that is why we have a new center in School of Media and Communication. And this center is where we have to bring different people together to see how we make a new road in the creative industries, to see how people can do research in fashion, in other creative industries, in uh, comedy, all these things that all oh, the booming things in the School of uh, in the Entertainment Industry to see how we can also research on what, how to help push those things forward. Last but not least, we have a very robust alumni. We have up to 2,500 members, registered alumni, and they are doing a lot in their different uh, uh, places of work. We have so many of them who have won so many awards. They are collaborating with us, helping us, making the prayers, doing a lot to help the school move forward. That's what I can say now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mark. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Mrs. Abara. Um, my question, my next question goes to the Dean of SMSS, Dr. Ulua Shola Uli. Um, knowing that the mission of the Pan-Atlantic University, which is to groom competent and committed professionals, and then saying that we, they are encouraged to serve with personal initiative and uh, social responsibility, of course, the community in which they work, thereby helping to build a better society in Nigeria and Africa at large. What would you say um, are the contribution of the contributions of um, the School of Management and Social Sciences towards um, ensuring that the students and of course graduates are um, working in in line with the, the mission of the school and helping to achieve that mission outside the university? Thank you very much for that question. So first of all, our students are made well aware in the School of Management and Social Sciences that uh, businesses do not exist purely for profit. That can't be the heart of what they do in terms of whether it's products or services that they're offering. So they're made well aware that um, they're supposed to handle themselves professionally with a very, very strong um, sense of ethics and also service to humanity at the back of everything that they do. So we have um, four departments. So coming. Right, so three of them are graduated students already. Um, the unit started as School of Business Administration, and I believe that's probably why uh, my colleagues have been mixing up the name quite a bit. We started out under a different um, name initially, that was in 2014, and we started with just um, two departments at the time, was Business Admin and also Accounting. And then um, two years later, introduced economics, and then it became School of Management and Social Sciences. And um, in October, we'll welcome a new set of newly minted finance students mm -hmm. for the BSc Finance um, program. So one thing that I believe that we've achieved so far is that not only are students employment ready when they graduate, they have an entrepreneurial mindset and their, the quality of their education is actually future proof. And they demonstrate it because it doesn't matter where they started or whether in business that day. When we get in touch with um, our alumni, finding out exactly what they're doing when they change jobs, the sort of jobs that they walked into and tell you that they're, they're moving in line with the direction of the future. Um, so many of them are working as business analysts or data analysts, whether or not they started out with that sort of background. And um, we had industry visits from a fixed income trader and also um, I can't remember the precise his book. But they interacted with our students on the financial analytics course and they were stunned with the level of interaction that they had from our students. They expected this at the postgraduate level. And these were third year students of the university. The sort of questions they asked, the sort of uh, um, analysis they were able to do on Bloomberg, it, it um, really astounded the professionals that were visiting them that day. So I believe that so far, we're making our mark. I enjoy industry visits when our students go on internship because um, I'm asking about the conduct of the students that have visited, I mean, that are currently placed there. And instead of just getting information about the conduct, uh, I'm receiving really inquiries. How can my own child award come to your university? It's, it's obvious that that's the is being made. They're taking the culture of excellence into their internships. They, they work conscientiously. And um, so many times we hesitate for the, for the grading but we don't have a choice. Most of them receive excellent grades because they have um, achieved excellence on the internship program. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Uluwa Shala Uli, for speaking to that question. We'd also like to remind our viewers online that you can drop questions as well in the comment section if you have any question for any of our panelists at all. Um, my next question is for the Dean of School of Science and Technology, Dr. Darlington Aholo. Uh, being the newest addition to the family, uh, my question would be, <laughs> the last born, as, as uh, we collectively call the particular school that is of science and technology. Uh, in the few years that you've been on for, um, it's a very intensive area, and you've emphasized the need and importance of practicalizing what you know students are being taught beyond you know the theory aspect. Um, what are some of the impacts, or have you seen any impacts so far in the two years, I believe? that you know, School of Science and Technology has been up and running. And what are the for, um, foreseen impacts, but I say the impacts that you see the school having on the culture of excellence going forward? Um, Dr. Adinsky, the microphone. Yes, I've found you, Dr. Please. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for that question. I think that the school of science and technology is I should go to the beginning. You know, you say, it's a journey. We are just two years old now, but it's a very interesting journey so far. Um, you know, prior to 2020, when we actually started, you know, like the Vice President said earlier, we're very intentional in PAU. We don't go into things we are not sure of. We, we, we plan, we think it through, even get the core personnel at the beginnings to make sure that it really is solid from the very beginning. And the same thing happened to the School of Science and Tech. The planning actually started as far back as 2012. It's not intentional, but I won't go through it, but the whole story. So from 2020, when we started, we took in approximately 100 students. Now, we have, in SST, we have, SST, that's School of Science and Technology, we have computer science, uh, mechanical engineering and electrical engineering for, for a start. I'm sure we'll add other programs later on. But before we start in, in November, the National University Commission actually visited to verify, in other words, how was what we we'll call the resource verification process. To see, are you really ready to start this program to see whether the faculty, the facility, at least minimal what is required to start off. Okay, and they, they, they did the, they, they were very impressed with what they saw when they came, and so they gave us the approval so we can start. So November 2020, we took in our first students, 100 of them. 55 were in computer science, and that continues to attract a lot of attention. Um, 26 of them for mechanical engineering, and then 19 for electrical engineering. So now we are about 200 second, second year, right? and we are still about to keep growing right? mm -hmm. now what has been the experience so far what i what, what the first thing i will tell you is that the very tough course computer science engineering is very tough and even for the tough ones <laughs> and i can tell you that it has changed the landscape even of the life in pau you see uh, the ssc students spend a lot of time studying uh, and the uh, assignments and, and all that. If I were looking for ways to make them relax more. So it's a very intense program. And I think so far they are measuring up to uh, the, the demands of the, of the course, majority of them anyway. We, from the beginning, like I said earlier, we, we are conscious that the kind of engineer we want to produce, you know, we have what we call the program educational objectives. We have adopted what we call the OBE pedagogy approach. That is, this is something that the current current is the Council for Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria they are promoting. OBE stands for outcome-based education. And we have adopted that because we want to see, see to ourselves five years on graduation. What kind of engineers coming from PAU do we see? And so we then walk backwards to make sure that what we have, the education we're giving them prepares them for that future. We have about four areas in terms of the program education objectives. 
So one of them is the area of, like uh, Banky has been talking about, entrepreneurial investing. Yes, our engineers, we're seeing them as entrepreneurs in the future. We see engineering as business, incidentally. So we're seeing them as people who are going to have startups. We're seeing them as people who are going to work in industry, but as in intrapreneurs, even wider in industry. We also seeing some of them going into research, academia. We see some of them, for all of them, very interested in lifelong learning, continuously improve, improve themselves. And of course, we see them also as people who are ethically minded professionals. So these are, you can see the four program education objectives that we are seeing five years upon graduation. We want to see them in those moves. So we walk backwards, our curriculum then takes care of this um, the future. And so uh, right now, uh, I will say that uh, it's quite loaded. <laughs> it's very loaded. They are going to now, the second year students are going to start what we call the Student Work Industrial Experience Scheme yeah, by July. And they, are, they have about six different projects they are going to handle. Of course, mentored by faculty. You know, one is the area of, the, you know, let's say they're going to build, design and build a solar cubic crew. For instance, if I'm very excited looking forward to this project. Um, they keep it out. We can now take to a community again what the VC has said earlier about community engagement. So they will design and build this cubicle to serve as what well, let's say a baby saloon, <laughs> you know, in one of the communities that uh, are nearby here to just improve the economy of the of the community and the other projects like, like that. So we are beginning to see that combination of theory and practice from day one hands-on approach to engineering. And that's why, you know, we are investing a lot in equipment. We have already invested quite a bit. <laughs> We're going to still, I know that uh, Elise is being <laughs> put together, <laughs> you know, so that not only from our own internal funding, but also we are partnering with a lot of industries now. We have an MOU, the of understanding with uh, Nigerian foundries, for instance, and our students are going to use the company as a classroom environment for some of our courses. We are signing up an MOU now with the, um, the vehicle inspection unit of the Dayan of the We also sign up an, a partnership agreement with uh, the uh, NU, the retail, all in a bit to make sure that whatever we are teaching them in class, there is an outlet for practical understanding and exposure. All right, and, and this is really our, you know, what we are bringing to the table from day one, and it's going to continue uh, um, throughout their program. By the way, the CWS is in three, very important. You have 200 in the second year, in their third year, and their fourth year, they will carry out this industrial uh, work experience scheme. But the fourth year, they will spend six months in the in industry, completely, six months, second semester. Just to again underline this, you know, linking between theory and practice. We don't want, I mean, we're looking forward to a PNU engineers you know, who when they finish, I don't want to see any of my graduates carrying his certificate growing up on the street. We don't want that. We want people who already either they are teaming up to start something, or they already, even before they finish, they're already being, you know, swapped by, by industry because they, they, they see their work. I don't know whether, you know, somebody else wants to add something to this. Okay. Um, two things that, um, I want to bring to the fore around excellence and working with uh, industry. Um, while I listen to Dr. Oni uh, speak about this, the, the number of the accounting students here before they graduate, they would have either become chartered or near chartered. So that is, they were working with ICANN mm -hmm. to be able to make that happen. And ACCA. So th this is very key because we don't want you to just graduate, then start it together. You are fully formed by the time you are leaving. In the area of engineering as well, um, I can understand because for me, I did a sandwich program, which meant I did six months in the university and six months in the industry every year for four years. And so I can appreciate when they say they have not seen a lathe machine from year one 
I was in a refinery working for six years on virtually all the machines that you could use as an engineer. And so uh, they work almost 100% again with Corel to be able to make sure that our students are professional engineers by the time they finish, not just the graduates of a particular engineer. But what is interesting that we are bringing to the table in the next few months, max next year, is the fact that there's going to be an innovation hub on campus. It's going to radically increase the tough life that you are talking about. <laughs> but it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun because we're going to go into communities and we say, what problems are you having today? And we're going to bring that back to the university and we will solve them. We will have in this innovation uh, hub the ability to be able to rapidly prototype whatever solution you want to have. And so you will have a fab lab and you can have a 3D printing. You can have all kinds of things that will help you to quickly achieve a solution, test it out. If it doesn't work, go back to the lab and then rule things out. That is going to be a major unifying, but also differentiating factor around what we do. And so you will see those that are in animation, working with those in the computers, mm -hmm. and then working with the economists and trying to create a solution that will make sense to the community, but also make sense to their pockets. Before they leave school, can you imagine, if in your second year, you, have, you already have a patent, and you're already earning a royalty. Now, that is different. In one of the hostels that we're putting up together today, even the way they live is in a communal way that they are able to discuss, provide solutions outside the classroom. These are some of the things that we're doing. So excellence is not just going to be about talking. It's about the infrastructure and acting it out in their everyday life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Bankoli and Dr. Darlington Apollo for speaking to, to those questions and those points. Um, I think at this point, we've come to the end. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge and say that, you know, being a student firsthand, I believe I'm, or rather I'm the first-hand beneficiary of these plans and that have been coming to life because being a student of ISMS, um, I'm in my third year, but my portfolio is already very rich in terms of movies that have been made, you know, different types of uh, technology designs that have been put together. And um, every now and then we get emails of our students who have now been chartered and have become chartered accountants. So that's really, really amazing. Um, thank you so much. We'd like to say a very, very big thank you to our vice chancellor and the deans of our different schools for joining us uh, on this panel session this morning. We'd also like to thank um, the members of staff and the journalists who have joined us. Um, in the absence of any questions, do we have any more questions in house? None, all right, thank you so much. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of those who joined us online, members of staff and people from outside the PAU community as well as the journalists as well. Thank you so much for your time. And to those who put this together, thank you very much to the uh, school's communication department. Uh, we appreciate the time and the privilege. God bless you. Is there he, anything from you before yeah, we go? I'd also like to thank the IT department for providing support. Yes, when please do not my mic up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful event today, hearing from our different uh, deans and, of course, the DC. And we truly appreciate all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, talk to us about PAU and the journey so far and where we are headed. And we trust that um, in no distant time, we'll see the outcome, positive outcome of all of these things we have planned you know, for the university. So once again, I'd like to say thank you to every one of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.